Do you ever consider how important the type of government you live under is? I was listening to Charles Price this afternoon, and he talked about a church in Cairo, an evangelical church, who has about 7,000 members. And he said, until recently, they were doing baptismal services about once every three months. But since the change in government, they started doing them every month. Now he says they're doing them every week. And they could do them every day. There's such a change in that city, in that one church. So if you had a choice, what type of government would you like to live under? And there are only three basic types. One is democracy, which goes the gamut from pure capitalism to pure socialism. But it's really an elected government where people elect their representatives. It sort of goes to that old adage that individual ignorance leads to collective intelligence. <laughs> but that's what we have. And it works for many people very well. Now, if you're pure capitalism, it means big companies can take advantage of you. Pure socialism means that the government can take advantage of you. But that's the situation. Another form of government is a dictatorship. Now that can come a whole gamut of types as well, because it can come from benevolent dictatorship to the type you get under Idi Amin or Papa Dr. Valdi in Haiti, a real evil type of government. But in this government, in that type, you have no say in what the government does. The government makes the rules and you abide by them or else. In many ways, God is an absolute dictator. He makes the rules. And we don't have much say in what they are. We have to obey them or pay the consequences. But he's also a benevolent dictator yes. who has our best interests at heart. Yes. Amen. Now the third type of government is one which really has no government at all. It's sort of anarchy. Everybody does what they want to do. Which sounds on the surface like it might be fun for the first five or ten minutes until someone else wants to do something you don't want them to do and then it goes downhill from there. And we've been going through the Bible a bit for the book by book. And at the time of the judges, this is when it had deteriorated to in Israel. There was really no government. The judges were appointed every once in a while to try to bring some order to the people, but basically it was almost anarchy. Everybody did what they wanted to do. In Joshua chapter 17, uh, it says, And the man Micah had a house of gods, and he made an ephod and teraphim, and consecrated one of his own sons who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It was not a very good scene. In fact, it was repeated again in the end of chapter 21 that every man in those days there was no king. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The people of Israel decided themselves that this couldn't last. The last judge in Israel was a man named Samuel. And Samuel was not a, not a young man by the time he finished his judgeship. The thing was that he had sons that weren't very good. And it says that his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after money and took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together 
and said, Make us a king to judge us like all the nations. That they wanted was someone to rule over them. But the problem was they wanted a king that would judge them like all the other nations. Now all the nations around Israel were all pagan. And the judges and the kings of those countries were obviously pagan kings. Now in those days, kings were dictators. What they said went, no question. You either did it or off with your head, okay? <laughs> so they said they wanted a king like all the nations. But this thing displeased Samuel, verse 6, when they said, give us a king. And Samuel prayed to God. And God said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not be king over them. Now there's a saying that, be careful what you wish for because you may get it. And it may not be what you expect. A number of years ago, I sort of told Caroline I would like to have a boat. <laughs> and she said, after some forethought, that, okay, I'll give you a boat. So for this day come, she said, here's your boat. I was expecting some kind of a speed boat. I got this five inch model, <laughs> which wouldn't do anything. But I didn't get what I asked for. So Samuel told the words of Jehovah unto the people that asked of him a king. And Samuel said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons. He will appoint them unto him for his chariots and to be his horsemen. He will appoint them unto him captains of thousands. He will set some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and to be cooks and to be bakers. He will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. He will take your manservants and your maidservants and your goodliest young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. But the people refused to hurt him. And they said, we will have a king over us, that me, we may also be like all the nations. So Samuel appointed him, them, a king. And Samuel, first book of Samuel, really tells the story of the appointment of the first king of Israel, Saul, and the subsequent conflict with David. Now Saul was your typical, ideal king. He was taller than almost anybody else. He was strikingly handsome. He had charisma. He was a born politician, what can I say? He had everything except one thing. He didn't follow God. And one of the main stories of this is in the battle of the Amalekites, when God told him to destroy everybody and everything but he did not destroy King Agag, and he kept some of the choicest livestock for himself. This was a story of a man who, did, who was not a good king. But then God found David, and David came up. In the battle with the Philistines, you know the story of David and Goliath. David was not your typical king. He wasn't big in stature. He doesn't really appear to be even good looking. He was young, he was untrained, but he followed God. And 2 Samuel tells us primarily of the story of David. Now David wasn't a perfect man. He followed God and he listened to God, but he still had problems in humanity. He committed adultery, he was uh, part of a murder plot but never did he actually leave God and never did he actually turn away from what God said to him or told him and in the end he actually returned to God and praised God for what he had done 
In his dying words, he said this. He said, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to him, he who rules over men must be just and ruling in the fear of God. And he shall make, he shall then be like the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, like the tender grass springing out of the earth, by clear shining after rain. Saul was a man who, who the people wanted, but he didn't follow God. And his legacy was one of poorness and of poor governance. David was a, was a man who was not typical of a king, <coughs> but he became one of the greatest kings Israel ever had because he followed what God said. Today, in the next few months, we're facing an election. Maybe we should listen to what David said. He who reigns over us must be just and must be based in the rule of God. When you think and when you vote, that might be something to think about. <laughs>